present generation with gratefulness. But they were gonna be thankful for the fact that we had initiated programs of development and so on, or sustained programs of ongoing development that they were then the beneficiaries of. The future generation is gonna look back at us as their benefactors. But with climate change, I don't think that's any longer a plausible presumption. The United Nations estimates that within 20 years, there will be something on the order of one billion climate refugees. That is people crossing national borders because they can no longer get water to raise crops, they no longer have access to basic drinking water, et cetera, et cetera. Over 800 million people will be without adequate nutrition. Adequate nutrition doesn't mean, oh, I'm a little hungry today, so you go to bed with a little grumbling in your stomach. Inadequate nutrition here means that if you're a child, growing up with a sufficient nutritional level to ensure the proper development of the brain. Meaning if you are raised under those circumstances during those formative years of life, from infancy through age about 11 or 12, you will never reach normal mental capability, that your cognitive functions will be impaired for life. And we stand by. We stand by and without thinking that we're doing that, we are not acting on behalf of future generations, not with the kind of rigor that we ought to be. There is, of course, a movement that's going on now uh, around the idea of compassion as a social emotion, where people say, if we acted compassionately, would we not be compelled to do something on behalf of future generations? And I think that's true, but I think we also need to understand compassion in a way that's different from the way in which we have. So what I'm gonna to do tonight is to talk about compassion, future generations, climate change, and try to bring those together and try to formulate a way of thinking about social justice that's really global, that will allow us to think of social justice in a way that is not just pertinent to us living today, our generation, perhaps those of our children and our grandchildren, which is relatively easy, we can all do that. We care about our grandkids, but what about those who we will never meet? So there are philosophical objections to working on behalf of future generations, and there's political objections. The philosophical ones are really quite straightforward, and they can be summarily sort of expressed by going to Emmanuel Levinas, a French Jewish philosopher, who said that ethics begins when we are confronted with the face of somebody different, somebody that we cannot encompass within the totality of our own personal experience, that it's the face of the other that is the beginning of ethics. But future generations don't have a face. The unborn do not have a face. And so when philosophers think about how do we engage ethically those who have yet to be born, they identify a number of real big problems. Number one, they do not exist. They have not yet been born. Number two, it's indeterminacy. We don't know what their interests are gonna be. We don't know what their capabilities are going to be. We don't even know what their identities will be. How do you take into account somebody that you know nothing about? And finally, there's a kind of a symmetry that we can affect future generations, but future generations can't affect us. And so when philosophers are grappling with the idea of intergenerational justice, they come up with a whole bunch of roadblocks. One of the standard ethical approaches is duty-based ethics. Well, what duties do we have to the unborn? Hard to imagine in concrete terms what real duties we have to the unborn. How do we take them into account if we're utilitarian or consequentialist and we say, well, let's figure it out. We want everybody to be as happy as we can possibly be. People have different views of happiness. So we have a discussion together. We decide what we're gonna mean by happiness. We measure it in some way. But how can you have a discussion about happiness with people who don't exist? You can't, the utilitarian approach doesn't really work. What if we talk about doing it in terms of caring? We have a care-based ethics. How much do we care for future generations? Our children, not too bad. My 37-year-old son, my 15-year-old son, I care about them tremendously. When they have children, I'll care about my grandchildren. What about the great, great, great grandchildren? Uh, five, six, seven generations that I will never experience. What does it mean to care for them? If I'm a social contract theorist, how do I engage in a contract with somebody who does not exist, with whom I can't enter into negotiations? 
if we're talking about deliberative democracy and that approach to justice, how do we deliberate together on the meanings of and means to a just society with people who are not here? So philosophers come up with a bunch of difficulties when we're thinking, how do we realistically and responsibly engage future generations and develop an understanding of justice that includes them in a robust way? Politically, it's just as bad. Everybody likes to talk about the children. We like to have political programs that talk about the children, right? We hear it in, the, in every election season. But the unborn, they don't vote. They can't assess whether or not we're doing a good job as politicians. Future generations don't have that kind of political position. Politicians will also say about future generations, it's not just that we don't know their identities, not that we just don't know their interests, we also don't know what their science is going to be. We don't know what they're going to have in the way of technology. Why should we change the way we're living now when in 20 years or 30 years or 50 years, science is going to have progressed so far that this stuff called climate change, it's just going to be a minor blip on humanity's rocket ship ride into the future. Why should we sacrifice now for future generations when probably, or at least it's possible, that they're going to have the science and technology to take care of every bad consequence of our action and our inaction now in 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years. And if you're a politician in a country like China or India, two massively industrializing countries, 1.4 billion and 1.1 billion people, roughly accounting for a third of all humanity, new to the Industrial Revolution and burning fossil fuels. Also doing a lot to try to do alternative energy. But the way they're looking at it is, hey, that first generation of industrial nations, the Great Britain, US, European nations, the Soviet Union got into it relatively early. Hey, they've been burning fossil fuels, cheap energy for 200 years, and have all the advantages of it. Look at the lifestyle. Look at the, the quality of life in those countries. Why should we Chinese, why should we Indians, why should we Southeast Asians not burn the fossil fuels and at least get our people up to something like parity with people in other parts of the already industrialized world? So at a political level, it's really hard to get traction. Right? Now one of the things that the Buddha said is that if we're going to address conflicts, <coughs> trouble and suffering, like the kinds of conflict, trouble and suffering that I think climate change is making very real for us, will be making increasingly real over the coming years. If we're going to address that in a sustainable fashion, we have to do that on the basis of things as they have come to be. The Afabutta and the Pali. It's not how things are now. We need not a snapshot of reality. We need a motion picture of reality. We need to be able to look back. Histories matter. So for people who are historians, this is not a big surprise. This is not news. But for most of us who live in a mediated world where attention span is increasingly short, and where when people talk about history, they're talking about things that happened a few months ago, maybe a year or two ago, to say histories matter actually has a little bit of traction, I think. It's challenging. And what I want to do is to suggest the two phenomena that when we're thinking about how we frame responses to climate change and acting on behalf of two gener uh, future generations, Two phenomena, I think, stand out as warranting our attention because they frame the way in which we're going to understand these processes. And that is global network society, the rise of a global network society, and what's been called reflexive modernization. Two phenomena that have been starting to play out over maybe the last half century. So we don't have to go back 200 years, but at least let's look back over the last 50 years or so. Manuel Castells is one of the uh, foreground thinkers of the ideas about network society. <coughs> and global informational capitalism, the network society is interesting because of the way in which networks are structured differently than old hierarchic systems. So those of you who participate in those things like Facebook, <coughs> things like Facebook, a social media network is important to be a member of because of the number of nodes in the network and the quality of informational exchanges taking the place through the network. It's not hierarchy, it's how many people are hooked in and what's the quality of informational exchange going on in that. So it's a different kind of a system. 
networks grow by two kinds of feedback. There's negative feedback, which says, you don't have to do anything different. Just keep your system running like it is. And positive feedback that says, you've got problems. You're not adjusting. You need to change. The system itself needs to change and adapt. So if you look at social media today versus 10 years ago, they look entirely different than they did. The platforms are different, the opportunities are different, the templates for sharing are different, the kinds of exchanges going on for them are entirely different, the identities that are being expressed and upheld through the social media are entirely different than they were. You know, we talk about not just gay and lesbian rights, now we have LGBTQ, right? That's a differentiation process in how we think about gender. And that is fed by this kind of a networking society, where it's not just for networks to grow, they just accumulate more. Rather, you have to accelerate interactions and amplify differentiation. That is how a network society works, by amplifying interactions, accelerating interactions, and amplifying differentiation. So what that means is in a network society, whether it's economic growth that we're talking about or social growth that we're talking about. <clears throat> increasing vitality comes at the cost of increasing volatility. That's something that we saw playing out with the global financial crisis that started in 2008 with people leveraging out uh, real estate loans, the debts, repackaging them, selling them off, leveraging out risk. And this connection between volatility and vitality is something that's crucial to the idea of reflexive modernization or world risk society. So a name for that is Ulrich Beck. So Ulrich Beck says, we now live in a period of time when because of the successes of our industrial commercial systems, we live in a world in which we can no longer export or externalize the environmental, social, political, and cultural cause of further growth. We can no longer externalize the costs of our growth. Reflexive modernization theory basically says we have now reached a point when we have to take responsibility for the cost of continued growth. The costs are increasing risk, uncertainty, unpredictability. So we have to engage in technologies and industries that we know are risky. Take nuclear power generation. What happened in Japan? 311, the Fukushima disaster. What is the cost of that disaster? Is there a dollar number that we can put on that, the cost? Not actually. <laughs> we're, still, we're still playing it out. Yeah, we're still playing out what the costs are. Can we put a, 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 a limit on it in terms of impacts on human lives? Not yet, it's still playing out. Nobody insures nuclear power plants, and there's a good reason for that, because if there's a disaster, there's no way to pay off. There's absolutely no way to pay off. Or we do deep oil well drilling. I have family in Florida, coast of Florida, decimated by the Deep Horizon uh, uh, oil spill. Why are we drilling down through a mile of water and then a mile of rock in order to get oil extracted out of the ocean to burn, to run our industries? We know it's risky. The Gulf of Mexico is hit by hurricanes all the time. And they knew this, and they were not properly prepared for it. So reflexive modernization, world risk society theory says, this is the situation we live in today. In order to continue the kinds of growth that we want, not just here in the US, but in China, India, Southeast Asia, Africa, Latin America, the entire world wants to keep growing, we want higher incomes, better standards of living, higher quality of life, more choices, more possibilities for consumption, and the only way to do that is to continue growing these industrial systems that have already been so successful that we're now experiencing the conflicts that come when we realize the cost can no longer be externalized. We are in a position of having to make responsible decisions in the face of, in principle, unpredictable hazards, threats, and liabilities. And we do so with unequal access to information. So.
So, how many of you have a retirement account that's tied to the stock exchange? Basically everybody nowadays. I mean, very few people have an old style pension where you get old enough and you get guaranteed income. But if you're playing money on the stock exchange, it used to be the case, it's no longer the case, but it used to be the case up until about three, four years ago, that if you had a tip on the stock market, a legitimate tip, an investment tip, you had 18 seconds to act on it. 18 seconds from the time the news broke before you acted on it, and guess what? None of us have access to news in those 18 seconds. We're not privy to that. If it shows up on the TV or on the internet somewhere, too late already, you're behind the curve. Now with big data and quantum computing, and what that's going to do in terms of changing the dynamics of power, it's a new ball game. There's an increasing disparity between the winners and losers of globalization. As I mentioned at the beginning, the inequalities are greater now than they have ever been. In the United States in 2010, the top 1% of Americans had 40% of wealth in the country. 40%. The bottom 40% of Americans, 160 million people, had less than one third of 1% of wealth. Today, 39% of Americans have zero in savings. Zero, nothing. 65% have less than $1,000 in savings. Since 2008, of the total increase of income and wealth in the United States, 86% went to the top 1%. So we live in a world that is characterized not just by inequalities, but by increasing inequalities. And I think if you look at things like the rise of a global network capitalism, a network society, combine the necessity of growth being stimulated by amplifying differentiation and accelerating interactions, combine that with robust thinking theory, we live in a different world than we did 50 years ago. The world that we live in today is not one in which our primary issues are problems that we can solve technically. We now live in a world where the primary things that we're facing are predicaments that we can only respond to ethically. Problems occur when we've got a set of practices that we're engaged in, used to getting the aims and interests that we have served by them perfectly well, and suddenly we find it's not doing the job anymore. Automobile, driving a car around, internal combustion engine, throw the gasoline in one end, a little bit of stuff comes out the other end, you get to go wherever you want, or at least where the roads will take you. That's a great system for individualized transportation. It's wonderful. Who wants to give that up once you've got it? Very few people. But it does lead to some pollution, though, right? So how do you deal with that? Well, there's infrastructure. You go mass public transportation, but that's got political difficulties, it's economic difficulties, it's social stuff, cultural stuff about driving, the automobile, design a hybrid electric engine. Increase your gas mileage from 20 miles to the gallon to 60 miles to the gallon. Bingo, reduce carbon emissions. It's a solution to the problem of automotive carbon emissions. Predicaments are not problems. They can't be solved because unlike a problem, like the internal combustion engine's carbon emissions, we want to cut those in half, cut them in a fourth. We can do that technically because we can define ahead of time what would count as a solution to the problem of carbon emissions. Climate change is not a problem. Climate change is a predicament. Predicaments occur when we're made to be aware of the fact that there's a conflict among our own values, interests, and practices. It's a conflict among our own values that's really at stake. Climate change is easy. If it were a problem, it'd be easy to take care of, right? Reduce carbon emissions to the minimum, get off the carbon economy, really aggressively promote you know, alternative sources of energy, actually start to living maybe with the idea of not a continued economic growth, but maybe zero growth or redistribution. There's lots of possibilities for how we could deal with it. Why are we not doing it? There are political values involved here. There's economic values, there's social values, there's cultural values, and they are in conflict with one another. Problems can't be solved because we can't determine ahead of time what would count as a solution to them. That's precisely what we lack. Problems can only be resolved where resolution implies clarity and commitment. 
Only if we reconfigure our basic values are we going to be able to address issues like climate change, or like global hunger, or like the fact that malaria continues to be an absolutely pestilent infliction on humanity when we exactly know how to deal with it. Why are 800 million people a day going to sleep hungry? Not because we don't know how to feed them. Not because there's not enough food being produced already. There's plenty of food being produced. It's because of the ways in which we produce food with agribusiness, how that conflicts with political interests, the investment of people who are paying big money to have big returns on their investments. It's because ultimately the people who are starving are not deemed valuable enough by us for us to do something about them. That's the only reason. It's not a technical it's an ethical one. And it's in that context of seeing that the biggest challenges that we're going to face in the 21st century are really ethical problems that people start to talk about, maybe we need something like compassion. Maybe we need something like a social emotion on which to ground our policy making. One of the biggest voices in that is a woman philosopher, Martha Nussbaum. She works primarily using ancient Greek sources, Stoic tradition in particular, and she's developed a way of thinking about compassion that I think is very, very helpful. So she says, what does it mean to be compassionate toward people? She says it requires us to make three judgments, three rational determinations. First is that there's something seriously bad going wrong for some person or some group of people. Not something incidentally bad, something seriously bad is going not just that you missed one meal, you're systematically undernourished. Very bad. Second, it's got to be undeserved. Whatever it is that these people are going through, or this person is undergoing, is not their fault. It's not because they didn't try hard enough, it's not because they're not conscientious, it's not because they decided to play instead of get an education. There's a structural problem that is leading to these people suffering in the way that they are. And the third thing she says, is that there's some sort of reciprocity between their flourishing and our flourishing. But I've gotta have some connection with them so that if they do better, it'll also be better for me. So Nussbaum says, if we actually can make those three judgments about a situation, the compassion that arises is going to be the kind of compassion that is not just <clears throat> pat you on the back and say, I feel for you and I'd like things to be better, it's the kind of compassion that you need if you're going to actually start changing institutional structures. So she links compassion as a social emotion with changing institutional structures. And I think that's a very important part of the picture. That if we need compassion for anything, it should be driving our considerations of how we go about making policy, how we do politics, how we do decision making across the full spectrum of our engagements with so that we can address the kinds of structural inequalities that bring about those unequal distributions of wealth and income that I was talking about earlier. But I wonder whether Nussbaum's conception of compassion is robust enough. I mean, number one, when we go look at future generations, are the damages that we're going to be bequeathing them to the environment, environmental damages, will they be considered serious? by people in future generations. Will people 100 years from now consider them really serious problems? Well, we go back to what I mentioned earlier, the uncertainty about what science will do, technology will allow us. It's a little unclear. That it will be undeserved? Yeah, we can, we can grant that. Future generations are not responsible for the carbon we're throwing up in the atmosphere. They're not responsible for the changes that are taking place with climactic systems and everything else that that's going to impact. They're not the ones doing it. They're not responsible any suffering that they undergo will be undeserved. That one's legitimate. But reciprocity. Do we, especially if you're like somebody like Nussbaum, who says that what we're striving for is to have structural conditions in which we can each make decisions and act on those decisions in ways that allow us to pursue lives that we want to lead as individuals. That's her bottom line. As individuals, we should be in a position to be able to do what we want to do and to be who we want to be. Now, a few of us in the room would probably disagree with that in principle.
But when you try to apply that to future generations, since we don't know who they would be, and since they can't affect us, we can't really engage in that kind of reciprocity relationship that she sees as crucial to compassion. So maybe we need an alternative understanding of compassion, something that's a little bit more robust, and that actually goes a lot further than saying, let's just allow everybody to be able to act in their own self-interest, because acting in our own self-interest at the personal level, at the national level, is precisely what we've been doing for the last few hundred years at least, if not for the last few millennia, and it's gotten us in the position that we're currently in. That is what has gotten us in the position where we live it in terms where in order to sustain the kinds of lives we like and want, we are going to have to respond to unpredictable changes and challenges. Be responsible under conditions, under information scarcity, when we can't really make good decisions about them. That's where we're at. Now, Buddhism offers a different understanding of compassion. Buddhism begins in North India 2,500 years ago, spread across Eurasia within a few hundred years, four or five hundred years, it was spread all across Eurasia. And the basic insight of the Buddha was everything arises interdependently. Nothing exists by itself as an independent thing or being. None of us do that. We all had parents. We all have friends. Somebody raised the food we eat. Somebody made the clothes we wear. None of us exists independently. Independence is a myth. It's a fiction. It may be a really nice fiction, but it's a fiction. And the Buddha says, if we really want to address conflict, trouble, and suffering, let's stop telling ourselves little fairy tales about independence and accept that we are all interdependent. When we have conflict, trouble, and suffering, what is the source of that? Well, it's interdependence gone awry. It's when the relational dynamics that constitute us as sentient beings, as beings with feelings and thoughts who engage one another. It's when those things go awry, when we have relational distortions. That's what conflict, trouble, and suffering are, relational distortions. What do relational distortions come from? Well, for we human beings, primarily three things. Ignorance, ignorance of the fact that we're interdependent, primarily. Number two, craving forms of desire. Not desires that your kids are going to have a better life than you have. There's a term for that in Pali. It's called kanha. Kanha is positive desire for somebody else to do well. That's okay. Good desire. The bad desire is the clinging form of the desire. The I want desire. The kind of desire that's like a flame licking around a log in a fireplace that will consume that log. That's the kind of desire that leads to conflict, trouble, and suffering. So, ignorance desire and habits, responding to things habitually. Habits are good. Learn how to type, finger type, touch type. That's a good habit, right? So you don't have to look at the keyboard while you're typing. There, there are good habits. They're not bad habits, some of them. But if you have a habit that's based on an emotional response, like I did when I was growing up, you know, kid, seven elementary schools, military family, every time you move to a new school, you got to make friends. This is 1960s, making friends as a boy, how do you do that? You outperform people, you get in fights, you beat somebody up, you get to the top of the pecking order, you become the guy, alpha male, okay, you get friends. Does that work when you get older? No, it's a real liability when you get older. <laughs> Some things that are habits emotionally, intellectually, socially, and relationally, those habits keep us from being able to respond clearly and effectively to the situation as it has come to be, and instead has us responding in a kind of pre-programmed way. That leads to conflict. So the Buddha says, well, how do you address these? Ignorance, craving forms of desire, habits. Engage in a set of intellectual, cognitive, bodily, physical, somatic, emotional, and ritual practices that will allow us to be able to slowly develop wisdom, attentive mastery, and moral clarity. Wisdom meaning an understanding of how things are independent, <coughs> as well as a kind of a, a freedom from these kinds of polluting influences from the environment outside of us. So we're able to filter things out so that the negativity doesn't take root in us. And when we have negative stuff coming up within us, we're wise enough not to let that out and affect others. So Buddhist wisdom kind of entails all of that. 
attentive mastery samadhi is both having focus and flexibility. Think of a martial artist, somebody who's really trained in the martial arts, total focus and yet total flexibility for responsiveness. And then shilla, moral clarity. And understanding karmically of how things got to be the way they are. The Buddhist teaching on karma is all the stuff that we're experiencing, all the outcomes and opportunities that we have as a part of our day-to-day -day life are a function of our own values, intentions, and actions. If we change our values, our intentions, and our actions, we get different patterns of outcome and opportunity. If we don't like the patterns of outcome and opportunity we're experiencing now, the point is not to try to change the material circumstances around us, but rather to change our values, our intentions, and our practices, that is to address the suffering or the conflict or the trouble we're experiencing as a predicament. So if you're a musician, I play guitar, dual guitars, I've got my friend playing, we're jamming together and I decide I want to modulate from a major key to a minor key. What do I do? Do I reach over his guitar and start poking at the notes on the guitar fretboard so I show him what I want him to play? Of course not. Do I try to tell him what to do? Of course not. That ruins the music. What you do is you try to elicit change by changing what you're doing to bring about the changes you'd like to see in the circumstances around you. So that's a kind of a Buddhist approach. You don't directly try to influence the circumstances because the circumstances are simply an expression of the complexion, the pattern of our own values, intentions, and actions. Change that complexion, you'll change naturally the patterns. You don't have to exert power over others to get change to happen. What you need to do is to demonstrate strength, which is a capacity for engaging in the situation in whatever way is necessary in order to keep everybody involved in those relational dynamics so that nobody decides to opt out and say, I don't want to play anymore, to stay in the relational dynamics and to improve the quality of play. This is associated with the Bodhisattva ideal in Buddhism. So the Bodhisattva is a being who says, you know, I could attain enlightenment, I could get off the cycle of birth and death. I could back out of all this trouble with all you people. I don't need the school anymore. I don't need the department meetings. I don't need the crummy friends who give me a hard time. I don't need the parents who are always writing me. I could just buy out. Have my own life. Disappear from here. The Bodhisattva says, no. I could do that, but I'm going to stick it out. I'm going to stick it out and remain in this world of conflict, trouble, and suffering in order to become a force of strength within that world to change relational dynamics in whatever way they need to be changed in order to be more liberating for everybody involved. The Bodhisattva says, I'm in this for the long haul. How many sentient beings are there in the cosmos? We don't know, but the Buddha said an infinite number. There are an infinite number of sentient beings. So how long does it take to help an infinite number of sentient beings attain liberation from conflict, trouble, and suffering? An infinite amount of time, I guess. It's not a finite game. Compassion, Buddhist compassion, is not played as a finite game. It's not, oh, I'm going to do something nice for you so you have some food on your table. It's not enough from the Buddhist perspective. What the Buddhists are saying is, we need to play this as an infinite game. A game that you play in order to keep everybody involved and improve the quality of play. Whether the game is politics, economics, it's market activity, whatever the game is, play it for good. Now, Buddhist compassion, that does not have a limit. Buddhist compassion is not something I do on behalf of others because if we're all interdependent, if we're really interdependent, that implies that we also interpenetrate with one another. So Fa Zong, Chinese Buddhist, 7th, 8th century, was asked by people, you know, you've got this teaching that all sentient beings have the capacity for liberation, for enlightenment. So does that mean that we're all the same somehow? Do we have some same common essence that unites all of us? There was this teaching about Buddha nature. But being a Chinese, Fa Zong did not say, Yes, we have all a common essence. What he said, Xing is a propensity. Xing is not an, an internal essence. Our nature is a set of propensities that we have. It's dispositions that we have. It's a way of relating. 
He said, Buddha nature means that we all have a natural propensity for a disposition for entering into enlightening forms of relationality. That's what we all have. And that doesn't mean that we're all the same because we're all in a different position. So Fazan said, what we really need to do in order to be truly compassionate is to understand that everything is actually non-dual. We need to have an, a realization of non-duality. Non-duality does not mean everything's the same. Non-duality in his terms means everything is the same insofar as we differ from one another and for one another. And he uses an example, timber frame building. Chinese timber frame building, simplest construction for poles or columns. You have some girders that connect those, rafters that fit on top of those, bracketed in, purlins that go on top of those, uh, clay tiles that are on top of the purlins. There are no nails, no fasteners, it's just joints cut a certain way, layer those pieces of wood on top of another, throw the tiles on top, the weight of the tiles compresses the joints, holds everything together, the thing stands. It's not fastened to the ground, nothing is fastened to each other. What does that mean? Fazang says what it means is that each individual thing is the cause of the totality of all things. Each thing is the cause of all the other things. So the roofing tiles, you take those away, first time the wind comes along, blows the whole thing down. Take away the purlins, you don't have anything to put the roofing tiles on. Take away the rafters, you don't have anything to put the purlins or the roofing tiles on. Take away the poles and you can't have anything. What you have is a bunch of wood on the ground. To have a rafter, it means it's in a certain relationship with the girders that connect the poles and with the ridge beam at the top and that supports the purlins. That according to this way of looking at things, understanding the world non-dually is to understand that each and every one of us is what we mean for everybody else. We are what we mean for others. Now what happens if you apply that to future generations? If we apply it to ourselves as persons, Michael, you've got a future self ahead of you, right? Are you the same or different from that future self? Experience. You can't, really an answer, you can't really answer that question. I mean, when you were 15 years old and you thought about yourself five years out at 20 or 25 or 30, you're thinking toward your future as what? Is it the same person, a different person? It's not a good question, right? We have some relationship to our futures. If you look at things non-dualistically, in the same way that we compassionately do things on behalf of our future selves, we don't eat too much, so we don't have too much cholesterol, we exercise regularly so we can continue playing soccer with our kids as long as we can, you know, we do things on behalf of our future selves so we can live long, vital, robust lives. But from this Buddhist perspective, that is exactly the same as living on behalf of future generations. There is no difference between our future selves and future generations. At every level, we are what we mean for others. When future generations look back at what we're doing today and our patterns of action and inaction, they will determine what we mean for them. Were we their benefactors? Were we people who set them up for suffering? Were we people who threw them into a world where they're basically imprisoned by their circumstances, the uncertainties that they face? What they think we mean for them will become who we are. If we really are what we mean for others, future generations' perspectives on us will determine who we are. To think the world that way is to think of ourselves as intergenerational <coughs> beings. We're not beings who exist in one place at one time. The whole ideal of the Bodhisattva, the compassion of the Bodhisattva, is based on the fact that there is an infinite amount of time, and we are present throughout all of it, compassionately, without making any limits, without drawing a limit. That has real implications for how we understand intergenerational justice. It changes the game when we start thinking about future generations. Right now with justice, there are two kind of competing main theories, universalists and particularists. 
The universalist, like John Rawls would say, well, the primary thing is equality. And we want to be able to design societies in which everybody has equal opportunity to be who they want and to do what they want to do. So Rawls says, the best way to do that, let's engage in all of our deliberations about how to organize society, how to design society from behind a veil of ignorance about who we're going to be in the society that we're designing. So the presumption is, is if you don't know if you're going to be a billionaire, you might be one of the people who's the bottom, 40% of the population that has less than one third of 1%. If you think you might end up being one of those people, maybe you're going to design a different society than if you're deciding, ah, I'm going to be a billionaire. I'm going to decide, design a society that's going to work out in my interest and the way I understand it now. So Rawls's insight is a really good one in many ways. If we don't know who we're going to be in society, what particular roles we're going to be playing in that society, we're bound to be more egalitarian in our construction of society. Sounds pretty good. But then feminists, and post-colonialists come along and they say, what a joke, this is utopia. If we're gonna go from where we are now with the exact kinds of injustices that we're living under, the kinds of inequalities that we're experiencing to a more just, more equal world, the root cannot be this utopian one of imagining yourself behind a veil of ignorance and sort of deliberating in the abstract in an imaginary world about what society you wanna live in. No, the roots to the future that is more just begin from here where we are. And here where we are, are we are people who have differences in history and experience and identity. And we need to take history, experience, and identity into account. It's the particulars of who we are as persons that really do matter. And any viable route to justice, practically speaking, has to begin with these particularities of identity. So equality as key to justice for the kind of universalist. Identity as key to justice for the particular. The people who would say, we don't just need to recognize difference, we need to respect difference, and in some cases make reparations for difference because of historical circumstances. Again, a very, very powerful vision. But we live in a world where, in spite of having these both the universalist and particularist forms of justice and approaches to them playing out for at least the last, well, with universalist a few hundred years, the particularist ones maybe a little less, let's call it 50 years. We still have glass ceilings. We still have Black Lives Matter. We still have the inequalities I was talking about. Somehow, these ways of thinking about justice seem impotent to be able to get at the relational distortions that we're experiencing. And the alternative, from a Buddhist perspective, is let's not take the individual as the basic unit of analysis. Both the particularist and the universalist the individual human being is the basic unit of analysis, or the individual gender group, or the individual ethnic group, or the individual religious group, but they're all treated as individuals. But what if we take relational dynamics as basic? What if we really are relationally constituted? What would relational justice look like? If injustice, for the universalist in particular, is anything that would limit our choice and our ability to lead lives in our own self-interest. Injustice in a relational form of justice. Relational injustice is anything that attenuates or lessens our commitments to and our capacities for both differing from and differing for others. It's anything that would work against enhancing diversity and equity. Where diversity is not mere variety, it's just uh, multiples, many different things being present in the same room together. Diversity is when the differences that are present are activated as the basis of mutual contribution to sustainably shared flourishing. It's a quality of relational dynamics. It's not a mere fact of multiplicity, it's a quality. Variety, you can see at a glance. Look around this room, lots of variety. We've got the Hispanics, and we've got the Asians, and we've got the Caucasians. We don't have any blacks in the room. We can imagine there were blacks in the room. You can see the variety culturally, the variety by age, just at a glance. Diversity is not visible at a glance. It's a relational dynamic, a quality that can only be realized when we have the courage not just to differ from one another, but also to differ for one another. A zoo is species variety, and ecosystem is species diversity. 
It's when the differences among everybody who's present create the conditions for sustainable and adaptive evolution. Thinking that way, equity is not equality of opportunity. If relational dynamics are basic, we're not in a position of, say, comparing Michael's versus you know, Donna's sort of estates in the world and saying, well, you've had more <laughs> education than she has, and therefore, there's not e was there equal opportunity? Well, you both could have gone to university, both could have gotten PhDs, da 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 da. It's not that kind of thinking any longer. Equity in this Buddhist way of looking at things, if we take non-duality, interdependence as basic, equity is acting, yeah, in our own self-interest. We're animals, we do that. Animals, we have to live, we have to eat. We're gonna eat something. Everything we're gonna eat is gonna be alive. We can't live by eating dead things, like dirt, rocks, no, we don't live that way. We take living forms into us, self-interest. We're gonna act in our self-interest, that's part of being a sentient being. What's an enlightening sentient being? Is a sentient being who does that, acts in your own self-interest, but in ways that are deemed valuable by others. And that's the condition that you need to bring about equity. Equity is equality of opportunity just says nobody's excluded from playing the game. Equity as diversity, the way that I'm talking about it here, is everybody's not excluded. No one's excluded, true. But what we're really worried about, what is the quality of inclusion? What is the quality of inclusion? You can put the students in the classroom, this Anapisi graph. It's all about Asian American students, Pacific Islander students, Native American students getting into the college classroom and prospering. Well, you can put them in the classroom, but how do you improve the relational quality that's taking place among students, with the faculty, with the community around it, and with the nation as a whole, with the world as a whole? It's the quality of relational dynamics that we need to be concerned most about. So thinking about future generations from this Buddhist perspective is not an act of altruism. It's not acting on behalf of others in ways that might hurt our own interests. It's a way of trying to figure out the very, very difficult thing of figuring out with all the vulnerability that goes along with not just differing from others, but having the courage to differ for them, to be able to engage that process in an open-ended way, in a way that allows us to be both vulnerable and committed, having the clarity and commitment that this is what we ought to be. That kind of courage is not something that comes easily. It's not something you can read in a book. It's something that you have to engage in as a practice. So in the film that I was coming over, uh, the airplane last night, I watched a movie called Ashby. It's not a great movie, but it has a, like, a nice little story to it about it. It's a coming of age thing. Kid playing football. And the thing that he can't quite figure out, he's got all the talent, but he doesn't like to get hit. <laughs> And you can't play football if you don't want to take the hit. So he learns to take the hit on the football field and emotionally and so on. It's you know, a growth group. But just like that character, we have to be willing to take the hit. We have to be willing to take the hit of people who don't quite understand where we're coming from at the beginning and have the courage to kind of keep powering on through that. That requires a lot of strength. And the strength, I think, comes out of being part of a community, like the one that you have here at Middlesex, uh, that this grant is a part of, that the associations of ASDP have been a part of for these last 25 years. It's the beginnings of that, trying to bring about real diversity, real equity, for the purpose of realizing social justice that has not just some impacts within this generation, but for generations to come. Thank you. So we can have questions. Make it informal. Did I go too long? Not too bad. Or we could just repair to the bar and have beer. <laughs>